Welcome to Rice Folk. Come on in. Good morning. Welcome to worship this week at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you are joining us for virtual worship. This is Memorial Day weekend, and of course, we want to honor all of those who have died in their service to our country. We'll be praying for that later on in our service. And just as a reminder, our church office will be closed on Memorial Day, and our staff will be off enjoying some time with their friends and families. Just a couple of announcements about the life of our church. For the next couple weeks, this is our schedule. Our virtual services will continue to be available at 6 a.m. on Sunday mornings. We will have services at 8.15 and 10.30 a.m. indoors in our sanctuary with no reservations required. So you are welcome to come on in. And we also will be having outdoor worship for the next couple weeks at 4 p.m. in South Channel Park with worship and the celebration of Holy Communion. And so we hope that you will come and worship with us in one of these three ways as you are doing today. Our children's Sunday school and nursery care are going to resume on June 13th in kind of a one room Sunday school in the fellowship hall during each worship hour. And you are also welcome to sign up for Vacation Bible School, which begins June 14th. Their theme is the Olympics, so they're going to be going for the gold this summer. If you'd like to sign up for that, you'll see details in your e-blast, social media channels, or our website. We also um, want to continue to invite you to be the church. And our emphasis for this season after Pentecost is to be the church through reaching within. We are focusing on the basics of our relationship with God and the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. And so stay tuned for upcoming book studies, but check out your June newsletter where there is a list of books that could help you to reach within. You're encouraged to pick up one of these as these days get longer. If you want something to read and improve your walk with God while you're by the pool on the beach or on the boat. We are going to be having a couple projects with Warm Wilmington Area Rebuilding Ministry. Our youth group is going to have an in-town mission the first week of July, and so check out details about that. And adults will have a one-day mission with Warm on June 12th. And so if you'd like to sign up, you can call the church office or you can email Chris Brown. The information on that will be on your e-blast. And last but definitely not least, our patriotic service will be held this year on July 4th. And so email Julia, our music director, Julia Walker Jewel, if you would like to participate. The rehearsals will be on Wednesday night throughout June for that special service on July 4th. And now, friends, I invite you to take a deep breath in with me. To breathe in the breath of God who still lets his Pentecost fire fall on us. And to text one of your neighbors, may the peace of Christ be with you. Would you pray with me? O oh Lord, our help is in you, you who created heaven and earth. 
we sing praises to you today. You are wonderful, giving strength and power to your people. And we, all of us who are led by your spirit, are your children. Lord, today and every day, send forth your spirit and renew the face of the earth. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Now I invite you to join our musicians in our opening song. My name is Hope Brewer, and today I'm going to be reading Psalm 22, verses 25 through 31. From you comes the theme of my praise and the great assembly. Before those who fear you will I fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, for he has done it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger Traveling through this world below There is no sickness, no toil, no danger In that bright world to which I go I'm going there to meet my father And all my loved ones We've gone on I'm just going Over Jordan I'm just going Over home. I know dark clouds Will gather around me I know my Way is hard and steep But beauty is feel Arise before me Where God's redeemed Their vigils keep I'm going there To see my mother She said she'd meet me When I come So I'm just going Over Jordan I'm just going I'm going there 
never see my mother. She said she'd meet me when I come. I'm just going over Jordan. I'm just going over home. During our time of prayer, we want to especially remember and pray for the families of all who have died while serving our country. And today we also remember all of those who serve our country now as servicemen or women, either those close to home, far away, or across the world. We know that you have needs in your own life and in the life of your family, friends, and community. And so in the silence that is left, we invite you to lift up those requests. We rejoice with most of our school children who are finishing up maybe one of the strangest school years on record. And so we lift up prayers of thanks um, for all of those children, educators, teachers, and staff as well. And now would you pray with me? Oh God, you are our God of ages past and you are our hope for years to come. Wherever we are, whatever circumstances we face, you are with us. We give you thanks for the blessings of our lives. We give you thanks for all those who have undergone a grueling school year with lots of needs and challenges. We pray for rest and relaxation this summer for all of those who educate and all of those who learn. And O oh Lord, we remember with sadness those we have loved and lost, especially those who have died in service to our country. We pray that you would comfort all those who mourn their loss, protect all those who find themselves in places of war and conflict, and surround all those who spend sleepless nights waiting for news of their loved ones. And God, bring about that day when the lion shall lie down with the lamb. Let us use our freedoms not to serve ourselves, but to love you and to love our neighbors, living in peace with all your children. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, you have broken down the dividing walls and given us the ministry of reconciliation. You show no partiality, but we are not always so accepting. Lord, just as you poured out your Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and lit the fire of love and power in our hearts, help us to die to sin and, raised, and be raised to new life in Christ. Help us to see as you see, hear as you hear, open our arms and welcome as you open yours, that we would remind the world of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, who made all this good world, we pray for your church with its kaleidoscope of people, each of us created in your image. Help us minister well to the needs of all types of people in this world. And we pray that the world, all people, and all creation would know that we are your beloved. Lord God, we pray for those who suffer, especially those we name before you now. O oh God, whose love is beyond measure, we pray all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. One way that we continue to be the hands and feet of Christ, reaching out to all people is through our gifts. And so now we invite you as the musicians play to consider giving of your gifts to our generous God. You can give in a couple ways. One is by writing out your check and sending it to P.O. Box 748, Wrightsville Beach 28480. On our app, our smartphone app available in all of those app stores, 
or at wrightsvilleumc.org. Let us give generously to God.
Good morning, boys and girls. I'm so excited to have you join us this morning. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about children all over the world and God and his love for all people. So you see, I got this basket of eggs here. And you'll notice that um, some of them are white and some of them are brown. Some of these even have little speckles on them. So isn't that cool? Um, so these eggs are different. Now, I like eggs. You can do all kinds of things with eggs. You can scramble them, you can fry them, you can use them to make cakes and cookies, uh, you can boil them, and at Easter time, you can even dye them. So you can use them for all different things. Um, did you know, so we've got some white and we've got some brown. And I just learned the difference. So we got white eggs and brown eggs. And the difference between the two eggs is that a white chicken lays a white egg and a reddish brown chicken lays a brown egg. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, now, I wonder if on the inside, what the eggs are like. Are they the same or are they different? Well, let's see. Okay, so I've got a white egg here. I'm gonna break it. Okay. And you see, there's the egg. It's got the yolk. Looks like a regular egg to me. Okay, I'm gonna break this brown egg now. Isn't that amazing? Look, the two eggs look exactly the same. So, the outside of these eggs looks different. Brown, white, but the inside is exactly the same. And I've also read that the color of the shell, whether it's brown or white, has nothing to do with the egg quality or the nutritional value or even the flavor. It's just some eggs are white, some eggs are brown. I've even seen blue eggs and green eggs. So eggs can be different colors. You know, it's just like people. People have, some people have light skin, and blonde hair. Some people have dark skin, black hair. Some people have dark skin and brown hair. Some people have light skin and red hair. Some people have blue eyes. Some people have brown eyes. People may all look different on the outside, but on the inside, we're all the same. And there's one more thing. We are all loved the same by God. So Simon Peter was one of Jesus' disciples, and he was a Jew, and he believed that God sent Jesus only to the Jews. God gave Peter a vision one time and to show him that he created all people the same and that he loved them all the same. After he showed Peter this, Peter said, I now realize that God does not show partiality. Partiality is just a big word for he doesn't show favoritism. Like he doesn't have a favorite kind of person or a favorite person, a person with a favorite color skin or a favorite color hair or somebody has a, a special talent. He doesn't favor people one over the other. He loves all people the same. He accepts people from every nation who fear him and do what's right. So God also showed Peter that he needed to go out and tell the good news that Jesus is the Lord of all and that everyone who believes in him will be forgiven of their sins. When I was growing up, we sang this little song and it went, it was Jesus loves the little children. I do not sing very well, but I'm gonna try and sing it for you now. Jesus loves the little children all the children of the world red and yellow black and white they are precious in his sight jesus loves the little children of the world so whenever you hear that song whether you sing it or you hear it i hope you'll remember that god loves us all the same let's bow our heads and pray heavenly father help us to love others as you do without partiality Help us to tell the good news that Jesus is Lord of all and that all who believe in him have forgiveness in his name. Amen. Thank you for joining me this morning, boys and girls. Have a great Sunday.
Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good to be able to worship with you today, and I'm privileged to be able to bring you the Word of God. So today, our scripture is Acts chapter 10. We're going to begin in verse 1, verse 1 and read through 15. We're going to jump around to the middle of the chapter and then read the end of the chapter. Um, I invite you on your own time to take the time to read both chapters 10 and 11. I think they're very, very significant. And I'm still between prescriptions with my glasses, so I'm going to try reading today without my glasses on. So Acts chapter 10. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon at about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. He stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? He answered, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon, Simon, who is called Peter. He's lodging with Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. When the angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his slaves and a devout soldier from the ranks of those who served him. And after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. About noon the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heavens open and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said to him again a second time, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. Jumping over to verse 24. The following day they came to Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. On Peter's arrival, Cornelius met him and falling at his feet, worshipped him. But Peter made him get up, saying, Stand up, I'm only a mortal. And as he talked with them, he went in and found that many had assembled. And then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they invited him to stay for several days. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, your Holy Spirit continues to move. May it move in and among us and through us this day and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to start with a question. How many of you have ever eaten a bug? I mean on purpose. How about a snail? Caviar? You know those are fish eggs, right? What about octopus? Squid? Maybe. Snake? Probably not. Squirrel? Haggis? I once ate a breakfast bar made out of crickets. I actually recorded the moment. The bar was blueberry flavored and tasted much better than I thought it would. Some of us are just more adventurous than others. But on the whole, 
we eat what we're comfortable with and we avoid what's not comfortable. And what's not comfortable is usually what is either not accepted, acceptable to us in our culture or just not in our daily habits. What's the most unusual thing you've ever eaten? Think about it for a second. If you're watching this with someone else, share with them. Some of you might enjoy eating lobster or crayfish, crawdads as we might say, but you'd never think of eating a locust or a cockroach, even though genetically they all evolved from the same common ancestor. Most of us will eat the meat of a cow, a pig, even a deer, but not a horse. And yet, that's not that strange in some countries around the world. Humans have actually consumed wild horses for thousands of years. I know, it sounds gross to us. Because our tastes are conditioned by our culture and our circumstances. What we deem edible or acceptable as food has more to do with our perception of it than the way it actually tastes. In fact, even the way we look at these creatures varies from culture to culture. Whereas here, dogs and cats are VIPs, I mean, very important pets. In India, they are feral animals that roam the streets and are treated kind of like raccoons and foxes. What makes an animal either a darling or a delicacy depends on what kind of relationship we have with it, what labels we have stamped upon it, and what kind of preferences we have. But those kinds of preferences can also change if we get desperate or hungry enough. Just ask the early homesteaders. Squirrels, sure. Rats, mm-hmm. Birds, beavers. Anything is game when your stomach is growling loudly enough. And just as we are fussy about our food until we are very, very hungry, we're also fussy about the company we keep until we are friendless or become friends with people who we had previously seen as different from us. In fact, you can even go so far to say that we are fussy about whom we label as equals until we are in relationship with them. That's why in times of war, soldiers are literally trained to dehumanize the enemy so that their conscience does not kick in and lock them down when it's time to go to battle. This is one of the primary reasons that people suffer from culture clash when they re-enter normal society after coming back from war. We saw it in World War I, World War II, we saw it in the Korean and Vietnam Wars, and once again in Iraq and Afghanistan. People come into a clash of consciousness, so to speak, when they are faced with rehumanizing those whom they had formerly meant to dehumanize. This clash of values is a shock and confusing and causes all kinds of problems in our heads as we try to wrap our minds around how someone could be who was once equivalent as an enemy in one place in time is now supposed to be equivalent as a friend in another place in time. Clash. It's confusing. And sometimes the confusion leads to conflict. But the easiest way to resolve that conflict is to be in relationship with the one you're struggling with. And that goes for any situation, whether it be race or gender differences or cultural differences or just differences of opinion. We see people differently when we come into relationship with them and realize that they are made in God's image too and are every bit as human as we are. Father Gregory Boyle leads Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles, the largest rehabilitation program for gang members in the entire world. Father Boyle often tells stories of the way people view these young men. Often people will move to the other side of the street when passing by. Sometimes they'll hold their children close or avert their eyes. And yet he attests that these young men who've become Christian and have become part of Homeboy Industries counselors and staff are some of the most sensitive, wonderful, compassionate, loving young men you'll ever want to meet. In our scripture for today, Simon Peter is struggling with the early church's mission to the Gentiles. He has been trained from the time he was a young boy as a good Jew to avoid eating certain non-kosher foods. He's also had it drilled into him that he must avoid hanging out with unkosher people. This was not just his family's decision. No, this was the tradition of his religion that stretched back 2,000 years. But now these perceptions and traditions were impeding his mission as a disciple of Jesus. 
He receives a vision from God that tells him it's time to take a bold new step and receive the Gentiles into the faith. And he shares this news with others. Peter opens his mouth and said, Truly, I believe that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the word which he sent, the word which was proclaimed throughout all Judea, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day. That pretty much sums it up. What do Christians believe? Next time someone asks you, turn to Acts chapter 10, verse 34. It's all there. Possibly the oldest and maybe the shortest summary of the Easter story that gave birth to the early church. They hung him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day. And yet, no one asked Peter, what do Christians believe? Nor did anyone say, hey Peter, tell us an Easter story. No, when he got back to Jerusalem, they said, hey Peter, what in the world were you doing with them? They were angry because Peter had baptized Cornelius, a Roman, a Roman Gentile, a Roman Gentile soldier. So he's back at First Church Jerusalem, and Peter's got some explaining to do. You ate with those Romans, we hear. Meatballs, lasagna, other unclean foods. You even baptized them. Well, you told me to go and spread the word. Sure, but within limits, man. You have way overstepped your bounds, fishermen. Way over the limit, past all proper discretion. And at their moment, at, excuse me, at their mention of limits and bounds and discretion, Peter said, I found that God shows no prosopotliemptus, Greek for no partiality. It's found throughout the Bible. God is not partial. He won't take a bribe, says Deuteronomy 10. In Galatians 2, when he's questioned about problems between slaves and masters, Paul says, God shows no partiality. God makes no distinction between slaves or free, male or female, Jew or Greek. Or as Jesus said, he makes his son to rise on the good and the bad, his reign to fall upon the just and the unjust. God shows no partiality, says Peter. And you and I, the Gentile Johnny-come-latelys to the house of Israel, take delight that God shows no distinction. Because we wouldn't be here if God did. But you can understand why those Jewish Christians were so angry with Peter. A Gentile, a Roman, a soldier, a man whose sword represents the evil empire, the kind of man who just a few weeks back had hung Jesus up to die while just following orders. Peter's actions hurt the other disciples deeply. Why did you do it? How could you? You ignorant man who only three years ago knew little more than the difference between a bass and a carp. You presume to set aside 2,000 years of time-honored tradition and eat with and baptize this Roman? And Peter answered, God shows no partiality because of Jesus of Nazareth. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day. People sometimes say, you know, the devil made me do it. I think in Peter's case, Easter made him do it. They asked how Peter could kick down this holy wall of distinction. He answered by telling them the story of Easter. Jesus tells us, as does Paul and the other apostles of the early church, that the way you treat people bears witness to the way Christ's spirit is living and working in you. Or in other words, your ability to be in relationship with people who seem different than you has much more to do with your relationship with Jesus than it does the other person you're trying to relate to. Do I need to repeat that? Your ability to be in relationship with people who seem different than you has much more to do with your relationship with Jesus than anything to do with the other person. God made us all unique. We're all originals. Beautiful, dissimilar people. Thank God for that. But God also made us like pieces of a large, dynamic, beautiful puzzle. Our mission is to find ways to fit together, to be together. 
for together we create a beautiful image of God. We have many people in our communities that may seem different than we are. Some of them may have had tough, unmanageable lives. Some may have had lives filled with mistakes that we have not made, or at least not yet. And maybe our circumstances and our family dynamics have allowed us to grow up in a way that was different from others. But in the end, we are all human beings, all struggling to survive in the world in which we've been born, all striving for love in a world that categorizes far too often between ugly and beautiful, between normal and different, between clean and unclean. But for Jesus, all labels were libels. Jesus made no categories in the lives of human beings. He only made categories of the heart. As he often said to his disciples, it isn't what you put into your mouth and stomach that is the problem with our world. It is what comes out of your mouth and your heart that matters. Bruce Rigdon was a Presbyterian pastor in Gross Point, Michigan. And he tells a remarkable story about how the presence of the risen Christ breaks down and through all human-made barriers. This amazing story happened at the largest wedding that he ever had in his church. It was a full house one beautiful Saturday night. A full house of people devoted to this young couple. A full house of diverse people of different cultures and faiths. And included in this wedding ceremony was the celebration of the Lord's Supper. This pastor described it this way. After their exchange of promises, I moved to the communion table and reminded all who gathered that Christ, present in this time of joy and celebration, had in his gift of bread and wine made all our tables holy. And then I proceeded, as is our custom, to invite all who had been baptized and who loved the Lord to come forward to celebrate. To this pastor's great surprise, when he looked up from the table and looked out at the congregation, he saw virtually everyone, regardless of who they were and regardless of their faith background, everyone in the congregation was coming forward. What was he to do? Say, stop? Only the baptized are invited to the table? How totally absurd, he thought. What a travesty that would be to the Lord. And so he welcomed all to the table. And after the wedding, a Jewish couple came up to him and explained that they were children of Holocaust families. And that though they had lived by a rule never to enter a Christian church, their love for the bride had brought them there that night. The gentleman said, when you invited people to the table and everyone around us began to move, we couldn't remain seated. We, we know, Pastor, that it's Jesus' table, not ours. But we were drawn by some kind of love. So please, we hope we haven't offended you or your community. We were received at the table tonight and so deeply moved. Shortly after this confession, another couple came up to him, identifying themselves as Mustafa and Munir, originally from Lebanon. They said, so you know what our life has been like. You know about the pain and the bloodshed. We are, of course, Muslim. And they told how their children rose to go to the communion table, and they were drawn inexplicably to follow them. We knew we shouldn't be there, they said, but somehow for us tonight, the war has ended. Surely this is the kind of experience that led our denomination long ago to declare the table open to all who wanted to come. We pride ourselves on saying that we do not put a fence around the Lord's table. But for that Presbyterian pastor in this story, this was a huge breakthrough. And it's a vivid reminder of the radical good news that God shows no partiality. In our text for today, Peter had a similar, even more dramatic breakthrough. It's a story of two visions. One vision came to Peter while he was in a trance. In the other vision, an angel came openly to a Roman military man named Cornelius. In an interesting bit of irony, it is Cornelius who immediately knew what this vision meant and promptly obeyed. But Peter even though the vision was repeated three times for emphasis, only slowly came to understand what God was saying to him. Verse 17 says, Now while Peter was very perplexed in himself what the vision which he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood before the gate. The Spirit had instructed Peter to go with them, and he obeyed, following them back to Caesarea. 
Upon arrival at Cornelius' house, Peter found the house full of relatives and guests who also feared God and were e eager to hear God's word from Peter. Peter began by setting the occasion in its proper context. He explained to these Gentiles that he was not supposed to be there. He said, you yourselves know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit a Gentile. Peter was acknowledging his prejudice. But in the process, Peter realizes the correlation between this experience and his food vision. He rightly concludes, God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. Peter slowly realizing that he had been sent to this particular household for a reason. Up to that time, the good news of Jesus Christ had only been preached to the Jews. But Peter confessed that he now understood that this was no longer the case. I truly understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And with this incredible statement, Peter has finally reached his breakthrough. We can hardly imagine the shock that Peter must have felt. I mean, every day Peter prayed that prayer from the Talmud, which said, O oh God, I thank thee that I am not a Gentile, I am not a slave, and I am not a woman. Peter had been steeped and trained in this exclusivist religion that thrived on making clear distinctions between those that are acceptable to God and those who are the outcasts. This statement of Peter's marks a dramatic and amazing shift. Now the gospel can be proclaimed to the Gentiles, to you, to me. But I believe Christians still struggle to understand the full meaning of the scripture today. Have you ever had a breakthrough like Peter did? Are you due one? A white mother finds out her daughter is dating a black man. The daughter calls and said, we might come for a visit. The mother, mother replies, oh, that's okay. We'll just meet you somewhere. She confesses she's getting better about the issue. She may not have arrived, but she's experiencing a breakthrough. A lot of us have come a long way in race relations, but we still need a breakthrough. There and in other areas as well, me included, most definitely. But if we really understood the inclusive ways of God, we might find dramatic changes in our behavior. One pastor said it this way, instead of being so quick to judge and condemn others, both inside and outside the church, we'd be even quicker to forgive, understand, and care for one another. Instead of choosing issues and dividing into opposing camps and waging war against one another, we would seek the wisdom of the scriptures, welcome the insight of the Holy Spirit, and trust that God has plenty of love to go around. Instead of coming with our own agendas, we'd come together with the agenda of Jesus Christ. Instead of talking about others, we would talk with them. Instead of assuming that we know what would Jesus do, we'd get to know Jesus. Instead of imitating the culture of hatred, envy, violence, exclusion, and judgmentalism that is running rampant in the world around us, we would imitate our gracious and loving God. Instead of seeking our own power, our own recognition, our own way, we'd seek the way of Christ through humility, service, and mercy. Instead of trying to decide who should be in and who should be out, we would show no partiality in how we love one another. Then and only then will we be ready to go forth and serve in Christ's name. Then and only then will the power of the Holy Spirit fill our cup to overflowing. Then and only then will God's great love and grace be seen in our lives. Then and only then will the world see that Jesus is truly Lord of all. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pray with me. Gracious God, you fill our cup anew each day. Lord, help us to get on board with what it is that you are already doing in this world. We know the Spirit continues to move. Lord, move us in ways that are important 
so that we might reach out to the people around us. That we too would show no partiality, but extend grace to others. No matter what their background, no matter what their deal is, no matter what our difference of opinion may be. Father God, you've put a fire in our hearts. May we not be fire extinguishers, but instead go forth in faith. In your name we pray. Amen. We know that God shows no partiality. He showed no partiality to us. And so we can't show partiality toward others. Instead, we have to extend grace wherever we go. Go forth in faith. And may you take the grace of Jesus Christ with you. And may the Spirit flow through you so that the world around you will see that Christ is Lord of all. Amen.